Michael Gerber, author of The E-Myth, once voted the best-selling business book of all time, says the vast majority of small business owners are on a fool's errand. And he's on a mission to turn them from a bogged down company of one to an absolutely brilliant company of 1,000. It's a very repeatable episode 467 of the award winning Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Well, I say, welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Reed. And welcome back to your weekly dose of systematized marketing. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner who is absolutely ready, overdue in fact, to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into an empire. And that's exactly why this podcast exists. But if that's not enough for you, you can grab a copy of my popular marketing book, The Boomerang Effect, that I wrote with you, the motivated business owner, in mind. You can grab it over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Big episode today. We meet one of the world's more famous business authors in Michael Gerber of the E-Myth fame, who will explain the importance of systematizing any business. Concierge to the stars, Steve Sims has got another way to wow those wonderfully precious clients of yours and another motivated listener wins over $1,000 worth of prizes in the Monster Prize Draw, which is becoming a very popular little segment, I've got to tell you. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Oh wow. 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 Did someone say something? You know what that means? It's time for another business building tip to wow those precious clients of yours. As usual, all the way from La La Land, we are joined by the wowometer himself, Steve Sims, who's written a bestseller called Blue Fishing, all about the art of making things happen. Steve, this is our last wow segment for a month or so. So can you leave us with wanting more? Right. Well, here's here's a saying that, that, that again, it bothered me. I've, I've had some of these that we've done in the past that have kind of like really irked me. Mm. This one really takes it to a new level where they say, the client's never wrong. Now, the client's wrong more times than they're right. Why? Because the client doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job. If they knew everything, then they could go to Amazon and just buy it and not you need you. But a client, nine times out of ten, is searching for the right answers. Your job is to be able to confront a client and go, hey, I hear what you're saying, but I also understand what you need, and I'd like to introduce you to some alternatives that would get you there smoother, faster and more economically would that be of interest to you remember the client doesn't know what they don't know that's your job there's a whole lot of business owners listening that are shaking in their boots going i could never ever look a client in the eye and say what you just said yeah but you know the funny (laughs) thing is and this is i don't want to upset anyone but maybe yes you yes you do the people that have just gone oh i could never do that and look in the eye how successful are they? Correct. Because I guarantee you, the ones that are listening to this going, yeah, you're right, I've had to set clients straight a few times in my life, are successful sitting at the top of the tree. Those that are just coming up think that clients are actually their fuel. No, you're the fuel. If you've got, if you've got clients that don't uh, understand you, you're not marketing properly, you're not branding properly, you're not getting the right clients. But it's your information your knowledge that makes you a desired commodity. It is amazing, Simsy, how that, that, that phrase, the client's always right, has just found itself completely embedded into marketing parlance. And I'm sure if you went and surveyed <laughs> 100 business owners, the vast majority would probably agree with it. It's, it's um, yeah. It's, just because they're, sco- they're too scared to challenge it, I suppose. And that's the thing. I think a lot of people now, there's better the devil you know. They, yeah. They're in a rut and they'd rather stick there. And if there's a yes. couple of good sayings, it's a classic one, oh, it's impossible. No, the better one is it's only impossible until someone does it. Yeah. If you're sitting there and you want to look at this as a good thing, if there's people out there going, no, 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 you don't talk to clients like that, excellent. Because guess what? 
you're going to go out of business. I'm going to tell clients what they need over what they've asked for. And I'm going to succeed in this realm. I'm going to succeed in this niche because I showed that I care with what I know that benefits quite openly the client. Well, there you go. Another killer way to make your precious clients go wow. Thanks, Steve. Righto. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to a fellow who needs absolutely no introduction. But guess what? I'm going to do one anyway. This is an interview I did with Michael Gerber way back on episode 338. It's been so popular and had so much positive feedback that I thought I'd best bring it back to the top of the pile. For those of you who either haven't heard it or if you have, then it's probs time to hear it again. And if you have heard it and haven't implemented it, then it's time to implement because this interview is full of action, Jackson, let me tell you. Now, Michael Gerber is the author of the seminal business book called The E-Myth. You've read The E-Myth, right? How's this for some stats around that book? Five million copies sold. In 2011, The E-Myth was named the best-selling business book of all time. It's been sold in 145 countries, translated in 29 languages and taught in 118 universities. Good on those universities for teaching such good quality content. His client list includes the best of the best, Apple, Infusionsoft, American Express, to name a few. But his true passion is small business owners. And in fact, Inc. Magazine calls him the world's number one small business guru. Nice. Now, Michael has a dream to transform the state of small businesses worldwide. He's been doing that for the last 40 years, and at the time of this interview, he was about to launch his newest book called Beyond the E-Myth, and here's just a couple of lines from it, and I quote, Great growing companies know how to replicate their business time after time after time, and by doing so, they grow, grow, grow. This book is going to teach you how to do that. This book is going to teach you how to design, build, grow and launch your company so that it can scale, which means that you can replicate its success, which in turn means that it possesses the ability to grow like crazy from a company of one to a company of 1,000. Close quote. Spiring words there by Michael Gerber. So I started off by asking him, what's missing in the way most businesses are run? (laughs) That's a great question, Tim. My answer, uh, provocative as it may seem, is just about everything. (laughs) So, yeah, just about anything and everything that has to be done isn't being done. And if it's being, being done, it's being done for the wrong reason and being done in the wrong way. And that sounds, as I say, provocative, but it is so true. So I've been in this business uh, world, you might say, of small business um, for 40 years. Um, It was an afterthought. I didn't start this until I was 41. So you understand, before that, I wasn't even interested in business. Can I just ask you, what what were you doing in that first sort of 20 years of your working life? Oh, I was a beatnik when there were beatniks. I was a hip when there were hippies. I was a poet. I was a saxophone player. I sold encyclopedias. I framed houses. I did this. I did that. I did just about everything, Tim. Which one of those, all those things that you did, Michael, uh, put you in the best position to do what you then did with the E-Myth? All of them. Really? I would have thought encyclopedia yes. selling would have been pretty good. Every single one of them. Well, you got to understand, every single teacher I've had, and I've been so blessed by this, every single one of those worlds I lived in um, were populated or led, you might say, by a master at it. So my saxophone teacher was, in fact, one of the best saxophone teachers on the planet. And he only taught um, um, guys who worked in the studios And during the time then, when I was 11, um, and I was born in 1936, so during the 40s then, the studio guys played in all the bands and orchestras that you even heard of. Nobody knew that. 
Mm-hmm. But these guys just went from gig to gig to gig to gig because there were nobody better than them. So, so, so did you and have a, did you have a knack for attracting great teachers? I have no idea. Did you know at the time that you were attracting great teachers? No, I had no idea, Tim. Tim, I wasn't attracting anything. I was just a <laughs> kid who was doing what I was doing. But however it happened, call it serendipity, um, I had great teachers. So my saxophone teacher was a monster. I mean, he was just brilliant. And he demanded more of me than anybody would ever demand of 11-year-old saxophone mm-hmm. student. Because he didn't teach kids. He taught professionals. Mm-hmm. And he said at the very beginning, because I'd been referred to him by my saxophone teacher in New Jersey, whose name was Al Chesner. This saxophone teacher's name was Merle Johnston. And Al Chesner um, reffed me in to Merle Johnston, understanding that Merle didn't teach kids. He taught pros. But he sent me up there to meet him. And so Merle said to me, my mother and my father standing there, he said, I only teach people who want to become the best saxophone players on the planet. In order to do that, you got to practice. You got to practice what I tell you to practice. You got to practice how I tell you to practice. And you got to practice how long I tell you to practice. Well, as an 11 year old guy, that would have been very impressionable. And did you, did you find this happened in then other parts of your life where you were lucky? Maybe I people, did. maybe people saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And I don't know. You I'm don't not going to take credit for it, you, Tim. So when did, and I, I, I'm sure you've told the E-Myth story a hundred times, a million times. And, and, but I, I am interested to just understand with the fire in the belly, we, we, you did all those disparate things, all of them not specifically related to then going and writing one of the most famous small business books ever. Um, can you remember the point where you have you were sitting somewhere, you were having a conversation, standing somewhere, and you've, you've just felt the fire in the belly to go and write something that's going to change the way people look at their business? It didn't happen that way. Oh, I was hoping for some romantic... Uh, no, 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 no. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Um... On my way, having completed my my um, episode, um, learning how to work with my hands, that was essentially what I'm going to stop working with my mouth and start working with my hands. So I went down and pitched and pitched and pitched and got a gig um, in a kitchen, and then I got a gig um, in a development, and then I got a and I you know kept on getting fired, fired, fired <laughs> as I began to learn how I needed to do this called framing houses. And then I finally settled in and I had this great teacher. He was actually a guy who in his off times worked in Hollywood. He was an absolute brilliant carpenter. Mm. And in the other times when the Hollywood gig was off, he would go pick up a gig uh, running the framing uh, of a development. Mm-hmm. And so I got, I, I got, he got saddled with me. And so I went to school learning how to do that. And I became a pickup man on the track, meaning I would go around and pick up all the mistakes, the framing mistakes on the Mm -hmm. track to the point I really understood it. So I I was in Southern California. I took my young wife and we decided we're going to move to Northern California, as far north as we could go into Mendocino County, where all the dope was. And I'd become a contractor and live the idyllic life with the horses and the goats and, um, you know, little three acres and what have you. (laughs) On the way up there, we stopped by at my brother-in-law's house, my sister's house. Mm -hmm. His name was and is Ace, Ace Remus. Great name. Ace owned a small high-tech ad agency in Palo Alto. And one day Ace says to me, I'm there for about a week, Mike, would you come visit one of my clients? He's having difficulty converting leads into sales. Just meet with him, see what happens. So of course I said to Ace, Ace, I don't know anything about high tech, I don't know anything about business. And he said, no, you know more than you think you do. Just meet with the guy, let's see what happens. So he takes me to Bob and introduces me to Bob, the owner of this little company. And then Ace says, I'm gonna take off for about an hour, you guys get to know each other. So Bob naturally says, so, so Michael, what do you know about my business? Nothing, Bob. <laughs> So, Michael, what do you know about our product? Less than that, Bob. Well, if you don't know anything about our business, you don't know anything about our product, how can you help me? I haven't a clue, Bob. But Ace thinks I can. You like Ace. I like Ace. And we've got an hour to kill. So let's figure it out. (laughs) 
So, I don't know whether you realise, but I'm. Uh, what I see there is is Ace is just another person in your early years that saw something in you that you didn't see, and he put you in front of Bob, and the rest is history. Yeah, and the rest is history. I hope you gave Bob a signed copy of the E Myth. <laughs> yeah, Ace, Ace and I. In fact, we just saw each other at Disney. Who, Bob or or Ace? My my brother in law was just awarded a, a lifetime achievement award. By the Disney family. Goodness me. Because Marty Sklar, that's his name, was the vice chairman of Disney Imagineering and is the only guy at Disney who actually opened every one of the parks throughout the world. Disney Imagineering created the parks. Mm -hmm. Marty was in charge of Disney Imagineering. So we went for his celebration at Disney, and Marty was, there, um, and Ace was there. How fantastic! But I still see Ace. That would have been a, a long afternoon, I imagine. A few, uh, a few sherry's or uh, brandies. It, w- it was, it was an extraordinary time. Extraordinary time. At the start of this conversation, you said that. Um, What's, when I asked you what's missing in most small business, you said most things. Does that leave you saying the opportunity is huge for someone like you? Does it leave you feeling frustrated or saddened? Oh, no. The opportunity is the biggest opportunity right. on the planet. The biggest opportunity in the planet is really fixing that problem. And that's why I'm publishing this mm. new book. So, 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 so that new book talks about the idea. Uh, it frames the uh, it frames the problem that you raised as being a company of one. What does that mean? Well, a company of one is defined in the book as a company that completely depends upon the owner. If the owner isn't there, the company dies. That re- that is representative of ninety nine percent of all small companies. In short, they're owner-dependent. Um, the owner builds it around himself or herself, around his personality or her personality, and essentially started the company mm. to create a job for himself. Never thought of it that way. Effectively started the company to become mm-hmm. his or her own boss. And they go to work doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, busy, 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 busy. That's a company of one. I'm saying the transformation will occur when you can take that company of one and transform it into an enterprise of 1,000. And the job for doing that is so clear cut, Tim. And that's what Beyond the E-Myth introduces. Before you go into the system, just exploring that company of one, is it flawed every time? Because you talk about, you know, uh, going from a company of one to a company of 1,000. Two, two things come to mind. One is, I think some people start a small business, a company of one, yes, because we want to be our own bosses, but because we see there's a freedom in not having to answer to someone else. <clears throat> And so, therefore, they're kind of happy with that patch. Um, and, and then, of course, there's some people, and I'm, I'm guessing you use the word thousand, the number thousand as, as demonstrative. I mean, you're not suggesting that every company goes and builds themselves to a thousand people, I'm guessing, but um, is the idea that uh, it's not for everyone, surely, this, going, this idea from going from one to a thousand? Well, Tim, actually, what I'm saying is something quite different. What I'm really saying is until you truly capture the idea that I just shared with you of one to 1,000, that indeed the whole process of preparing a company for growth is a highly um, sensitive regimen that is documentable that every single company on the planet can go through then effectively what I'm really saying is that when you start your company, you're starting your company to eventually get it ready for sale because there's an exit strategy implicit in starting anything. And to the degree one is not privy to, aware of the method through which that will occur, they ultimately are failing to complete the cycle, which is a natural inbred cycle Mm -hmm. to grow. So I'm saying that it's implicit upon every one of us to grow. Now let's not think company right now, let's just think Mm -hmm. human being right now. It's implicit upon every one of us 
to grow, to go beyond where I am, to discover what I haven't discovered, to search and seek out something that I'm not aware of today and ultimately can only become aware of as I open my mind. So that might sound terribly optimistic, but you understand it's only optimistic or terribly optimistic if somebody has already decided to settle down Mm -hmm. into their comfort zone. And I'm suggesting, Tim, that comfort zone living (laughs) is death. I'm saying to live in your comfort zone and to be satisfied with living in your comfort zone means you stopped climbing. But just because I really want this company of one to think to settle, like to sink in before I get you to talk about what you call the hierarchy of growth. Because what if a thousand, a company of a thousand people? I speak to a lot of small business owners on this show, Michael, and one of their greatest gripes is guess what? People. If you come a company of a thousand, of a thousand people. people, the management, the yeah. But understand, they got to Tim. Right. You just got to wake them up, Tim. How? That meaning that's that's their that's their obsession. Their obsession is that growth is bad, big is bad, small is better. I don't know whether they think growth is bad. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you think that. Yeah, okay. I'm saying that implicit in that relationship with the whole idea of growth, a company of 1,000, is a resistance to it. Mm-hmm. And the resistance to it comes from negative emotions. Gotcha. Not positive emotions, negative emotions. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when I say growth is bad, any experience they've had related to growth was a negative experience. Yeah, right. Because it challenges their competence. It challenges what they've accepted as true about themselves. It challenges their comfort zone. Hence the phrase, growing pains. Hence, yes. So when my saxophone teacher says, I only teach people who want to become the best saxophone players in the world, you understand the guy you're talking about, I don't want to do that. Mm. I don't want to do that. Mm. Sounds like a whole lot of hard work. Yeah, I just want to play the saxophone. (laughs) Okay, stupid, and go someplace else. I'm not interested. But isn't that where a lot of business owners start with, uh, you know, they're good at something. The carpenter is really good at building houses. The guy flipping burgers makes a mean burger. The vet is wonderful at caring for cats and dogs. Tim, th- that's a a uh, that's an, a true myth. Okay. So the fact that the guy is really great at it. I'm saying bullshit. Cool. I like Michael Gerber has called bullshit. What? What? But but why? I'm not saying he's not good. I'm just saying he's not as good as you make him out to be, or as he makes himself out to be. That's the mythology. <laughs> I'm simply saying. Well, he does that because he's so great at it. Well, no, he's not so great at it. What's he great at? He's got to be good at something. Well, he probably could be, <laughs> but of course. You got to go to school. You got to begin to learn something you don't know. You got to even discover to ask the questions that, in fact, drive you to ask further questions about this extraordinarily complicated thing called my life. Mm-hmm. So I have a, a, a saying that goes along with my book: "Every life a legacy." Mm-hmm. And. Every life a legacy, every small business a school. Nice. So if that mantra that I'm using, and and I use it very frequently, is true, I'm just saying if it's true, then effectively what's lost by not approaching your life that way? What's missing by not approaching your business that way? Okay. So what is missing? Oh, Everything. Everything. We're back to question one. So, so, okay. Chip, everything. Think Steve Jobs. Yeah. Everything. What's missing? Everything. I was going to say, what do you mean when you say think Steve Jobs in that context? Well, just think Steve Jobs. Here's a guy who had no business starting a business. He dropped out of college in his first year. He dropped out of a spiritual search to India before he completed it. Mm. 
he took a job he was completely unprepared for, and he has an idea, enrolls his partner to go start Apple in his father's garage. No experience in business whatsoever, in management and marketing and nothing. And he was not the best technologist around. Mm -hmm. So the least likely guy in the world. So what does he do? He sets out on a journey to create the wealthiest company on earth. How do you do that, Steve? I'm guessing he had a dream. I'm guessing he had a dream and a passion for pursuing the impossible that drove him. And I'm suggesting everyone, every single human being can go further than they've gone, can find other than they've found, can produce something they never imagined they were capable of producing, but they've got to be wanting to do that. So we're not looking for people who don't want to do that, Tim. Okay. We're looking for people who are moved by the spirit of doing that and say, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. That's all I'm looking for. The 100,000 clients we've had. Gotcha. Um, that's all I'm looking for. And I want to find an easier way to make it possible for them to succeed. And that's what Beyond the Emits is about. We've framed the problem. I think we've very, very clear, clearly framed the problem that most small businesses have around the world, 99%, as you said. You've got this hierarchy of growth, which is effectively your solution to it. Assuming the business owners listening have the mindset and are ready to implement this, this is your way of taking them from a company of one to a company of 1,000. Can you walk us through the hierarchy of growth and, if possible, time allowing, give us a little story or example that backs up yeah, each of these I, eight I, steps, I can. Please. I don't think we're going to have the time for the stories to back up each. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a four-hour interview, but isn't it? I will be glad to take you through the process. It's really <laughs> clean, clear, and simple. And it begins, Tim, in what I call the dreaming room. And the dreaming room is really the, the, the venue within which we awaken the entrepreneur within every small business owner. So you got to understand that's the end game of the dreaming room. The end game of the dreaming room is to create the platform for growth. And the platform for growth is in sync with the four very clear personalities that live within a true entrepreneur. Now, you gotta understand when I say that, I'm saying that live within every human being. It's just that most of us mm -hmm. don't develop these personalities to the degree that they can become truly serviceable to what we're out here trying to produce. So let me describe what they are. So there's the dreamer, there's the thinker, there's the storyteller, and there's the leader. So the dreamer has a dream, the thinker has a vision, the storyteller has a purpose, and the leader has a mission. The dream is the great result. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. If you listen to Martin Luther King's recording of I Have a Dream when he first said it in Washington, D.C., to all of those people out there in that audience. When he said that, you'll immediately experience what I mean by this is missing in 99.9% .9 of all small companies, but it's also missing in most people. <coughs> I have a dream. It's the great result. Mm -hmm. The vision is different than the dream. The vision is the business model that is essential for us to realize or manifest, manifest that great result. So in my case, my dream was to transform the state of small business worldwide. My vision was to invent the McDonald's of small business consulting. You get it? Yeah, I do. I do. In order to realize, to transform the state of small business worldwide, I had to invent the McDonald's of small business consulting. 
That means turnkey, scalable, um, with kids at minimum wage, not experts at high cost, kids at low cost. I had to be able to deliver something to a small business owner nobody had ever figured out how to deliver yet. I called it the McDonald's of small business consulting, but that wasn't sufficient. The third step is the purpose. So the dreamer has a dream, the thinker has a vision, the storyteller has a purpose. And our purpose in our company years ago was to teach every independent small business how to become as successful as a McDonald's franchisee. Mm -hmm. Our consumer was an independently owned small business. And that independently owned small business, I call a company of one. And I call it a company of one because it was completely and is completely dependent upon the guy who started it and owns it. It's Tim's company. It's Judy's company. Mm -hmm. It's Jack's company. Jack leaves, Tim leaves, Judy leaves, the company stops working. Why? Because Jack, Judy, and Tim are all the energy behind that small company and primarily the chief expert in that small company. So that's the third step, the purpose. Michael, can I just pause you there before we get to the fourth step? Can Michael Gerber leave his company? Michael Gerber left his company years ago. Gone. Oh, yeah. Michael Gerber left his company years ago. Michael Gerber always leaves his company. (laughs) But he doesn't leave his company to leave his company. He leaves his company because he's built the system through which he can replicate what he has the ability to do to produce the result the company was designed to produce, to realize the dream, the vision, and the purpose. The promotion of, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking out aloud here, so I'm sure you'll pull me up. I feel like I'm talking to my headmaster too, which has taken me back a long time, (laughs) by the way. Um, uh, Michael, you're on this call promoting your new book. I imagine the success of this book is is dependent upon the amount of publicity that you Generate, not your CEO who's in the in the hot seat now. Am I wrong in saying that? Well, yes, you are. Um, and I- <laughs> thank you. I'm going to call you Mr. Dyer. He was my headmaster, so thank you, Mr. Dyer. <laughs> I don't mean, Jim, that you're totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here promoting the book. You understand? I'm the chief spokesperson uh-huh. for it, but I'm not it. So you got to understand, I'm not the book. And the book isn't me. The book is a means to communicate a point of view that's been created that now can be scaled in the hands of an infinite number of individuals to deliver exactly what the book promises. Mm -hmm. From a company of one to a company of 1,000. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's the system. Beautiful. If the system weren't there, Tim, this would be a fool's game. Yeah. Because all I'd be doing here is sitting here selling books. Gotcha. Okay. You got uh, it? Yeah, absolutely. Dreaming room, step one. Step two, vision. Step three, purpose. At that point, we're teaching um, all small business owners how to become as successful as a McDonald's franchisee. That's a very clear purpose. Is step four, mission? Yes, step four is mission. So the first is the dream, the second is the vision, the third is the purpose, and the fourth is the mission. My mission at the Michael Thomas Corporation was to invent the intellectually congruent system that was absolutely critical for us to be able to go out and say to a small business owner, let me show you how it works, let me show you how it works, it works, so you don't have to. A business development system. So I could then recruit, hire, and train relative novice coaches to deliver that turnkey system, which then was called the Michael Thomas Business Development System, to deliver that turnkey system to every single company of one on the planet. Uh, Michael Thomas, by the way, uh, sorry, that's a name you've just introduced to me. Michael Thomas is the name of the company that delivers the E-Myth, is that right? Michael Thomas was the company I first founded in 1977. Who was Michael? 
<laughs> I'm digressing here. Hi, Michael. Who's Thomas? Thomas is no longer with us. I <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, okay. So, Michael, Thomas, two guys. Gotcha. T- tell me, uh, just to be clear on the mission. So, that mission is where the rubber hits the road. It is. You got it, it. Is, is it the how? How are we it's going? The how. Mm, gotcha. It's the how. It's the what, the how, the who, that. Yes, it's everything. It is the mission. It's the absolute clear content. That is absolutely critical if we're going to realize our dream, our vision, and our purpose. Each of them dragging along the question, well, how are you going to do that? 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 You understand that the dream, we're not concerned about how. Yeah, 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 yeah. At the vision, we're not concerned about how, other than the great how, McDonald's. At the purpose, we're not thinking about how. We're thinking about what. We're going to produce this result for every single one of our independently owned small business clients worldwide. Now we're at the mission, and the mission is to develop the how. How we do what we promised to do in a way that will enable us to do it better than anybody's ever thought it could be done before. Hmm. And when you see that, you understand why that is so critical as the platform for any company that's going to go from one to 1,000. Michael, before you take us through the other four steps, um, the way you've described those first four is crystal clear. Like, I get it. The penny has dropped for me. (laughs) (laughs) Hallelujah, says Michael. Finally, we've got to Tim. If you get to Tim, you can get to anyone. But but, but here's here's the thing. and I'm, I'm an ad guy, I've originally spent 10 years at BBDO and, you know, I've, I've sat through branding workshops, core values got workshops. It. You got it, right? Yeah. And and I think I have a bit of a bad taste in my mouth when I hear things like visions and missions and core values. You haven't mentioned and core I don't values. Blame okay, <laughs> b- b- because you roll up to, for ex- oh, why not, let's not mention brands, but you roll up to head office and on the wall at reception uh, is, is their mission statement... <laughs> Sorry, I yeah, fell asleep right. then. Um, right. I'm back. I'm back. Um, and you. and it's 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 motherhood statements. It's lip service. And I, yes. my question is, you've this not, isn't. I know it's not. But it, well, the questions are not, and nor are your answers for your business. But how does the vet or the the plumber or whoever's listening to this that goes, I want a company of a thousand, but how do I get such succinct answers to those big questions, those first four steps that Michael's posing? Very, very simple. You go into the dreaming room and you come out whole. (laughs) Now understand everything's a process, Tim. If we hadn't created a process for all of this, it would just be phantasmagoria. It would just be rhetoric. (laughs) It would just be empty speak. It would just be more of the same. This is anything but more of the same. As you've experienced, and I know you have, when you talk about small business owners, you know who speak about the E-Myth and speak about Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. You know the profound impact it's had on those people. Mm -hmm. Those are the people we're looking for, Tim. We're looking for the people who respond to what I've said from their heart, from their imagination, from their passionate desire to go beyond where they are. If they're not those people, we can't have Mm. or make an impact on them. Just can't. What you're saying is you've got to go in with the right mindset. You've got to walk into that dreaming room, which sounds like a wonderful place, by the way. Just I'm seeing cotton wool and marshmallows. I don't know why, but you you know... Blood and guts and and (laughs) fighting and arguing. Right. Okay, but, but you've got to go in with the right mindset. Yep, but understand that if we haven't spoken to that individual... And um, created the right mindset, the grounding Uh, for the conversation, then shame on us. mm -hmm. Yeah. So understand, nobody's sitting out there saying, oh, grow me, grow me, grow me, grow me, grow me. Mm. Nobody's doing that. But let me give you a perfect example. You said, give me an example. You're familiar with the company Infusionsoft. I am. Yes. So the boys at Infusionsoft, the founders of Infusionsoft, the executives of Infusionsoft came to me to participate in a dreaming room. This is about six and a half years ago. 
And one of them, Scott Martineau, came to me before it started and he said, hey, Michael, we know E-Myth. We believe E-Myth. Systems thinking, man, I'm telling you, it's the greatest book. It's a, but what's this dreaming stuff? So Tim, essentially, he's saying, I see it as pillows and muffles and mark. What did you call it? <laughs> Marshmallows and cotton wool. Right, right. All that. He said, we don't need that. <laughs> we need to figure this out. The operation of what we're doing. And I said, Scott, shut up. Go sit down. Hmm. And when we're done, in two and a half days, then come up to me and tell me what happened. Well, that's what happened. The rest is history. The rest is history. They say, Clayt, um, Scott, all the boys at Infusionsoft, mm -hmm. say three things have contributed to the profound impact we've had. Growing from a company when they walked into the dreaming room, very, 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 very small, to a company today doing 100 million plus in revenue, the 35,000 clients worldwide, with close to 1,000 people employed on its way to becoming a billion dollar company. Hmm. But understand, when I met them, they had no idea that's what they were going to do, nor would they even agree that's what they were going to do. It's lucky you said at the start of that meeting that you just all you wanted was 20% of the company. Right. <laughs> you, you do understand. You do understand that I'm not expecting that, in quotes, small business owners, oh, wow, yeah, I want to get to 1,000. Yeah. I'm not suggesting that. Of course they don't. They look at me like I'm crazy. But that's the game. That's the game. Yeah, you know I'm saying okay. that's the game. The game is wake up. Now, I'm not somebody who's selling a bill of goods. I mean, I've worked with the best of the best of the best of the best of the best. I've applied my mindset to millions of small companies around the world in 145 countries. So I'm not just some guy saying whatever. I'm the Peter Drucker of small business. So when I say this to you, you gotta understand, this is not only possible, it's absolutely probable mm. that if you were to get it, that's all, just if you were to get it, something you've never expected to happen will happen. Oh, Michael, I love that. How's that from a, a song from the big chair, I call that? That was wonderful. Okay, let's get, well, I'm conscious of time. Uh, step five of the hierarchy of growth. Okay, so let's talk about the four steps in the process of creating a company of one to a company of 1,000. The first step is called the job. Can, can I just be clear here? Because now I'm, I'm, just, I just, uh, I'm a simple man, Michael. Uh, is, is the hierarchy of growth eight steps or are there two lots of four steps? Four steps. So the first step... Well, understand was, it's eight steps. It's eight steps. We just finished four. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is really step five? <laughs> this is step five. Go. Yep, it's called the job. Now understand, we're gonna take our company, our company of one, and we're gonna separate the company into two parts. I call them Old Co, capital O-L-D, mm -hmm. capital C-O. Mm -hmm. That's what you do today. And New Co, capital N-E-W, capital C-O. A blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. Nice. We're not going to go to work on old code. We're going to go to work on new code. Mm -hmm. We're not going to fix broken businesses. We're going to create new ones. So hear me. Now we've got separation. You got it? One part of your attention is on old go. Yes. That's where you're making your money. That's where you're making a living. That's all the stuff you're doing, 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 doing. And one part of yourself is focused on new co. Call new co the enterprise to become. Mm -hmm. And so when we go to work on new co, we're going to start at the very beginning. Now, old clothes over there doing what it's doing. You're not going to spend a lot of money on it. You're not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can just allow it to do what it does. Battling along, killing the owner. Yeah. Okay. So then we've got Nuco, which is basically a, a white canvas, right? The job is your product. Mm-hmm. But you understand you're designing that product to serve whom? 
your dream, your vision, your purpose, and your mission. So the platform isn't for old co, the platform is for new co. Mm-hmm. I now have a dream, I now have a vision, and now have a purpose, I now have a mission. Now I'm going to create a client fulfillment system. It's what I'm going to deliver to our most important customer that's going to transform the state of whatever they do in a way they've never expected before. We're going to design, build, launch, and grow our client fulfillment system so that when I'm done, it's turnkey. Nice. You got it? Yep. You got that? Yeah, I have. That's taking it from being a job to a whole new company that is less dependent upon you, the owner, right? Of course. Hmm. Because until you turnkey it, you can't hand it off to anybody else. Mm -hmm. So what most often happens in old co is they want to fix old co, but they don't want to fix old co to the point where the owner isn't there anymore. Mm Mm-hmm. We don't want the owner there anymore. He's getting in the way of him or he or she's getting in the way of herself. Yep. He's getting in the way of impossible. Yep. Yep. So the job, client fulfillment system, turnkey, see the manual, see the book, see the binder, see the steps in the process. This is how we do it here. This is how we do it here. This is who we are. Built. Done. Proven. This is the whole the whole system, the whole blueprint of how we do things around here that relies on a number of people, not just the owner. How you do client fulfillment. Client fulfillment is the product you sell. Mm-hmm. If you're a chiropractor, client fulfillment. If you're an attorney, client fulfillment. If you're a graphic designer, client fulfillment. If you're a copywriter, client fulfillment. You follow me? Yep. Got it. Whatever it is you're going to deliver, we're now about to design, build, launch, and grow it so it's scalable. Step six. The next step is called the practice. So we go from the job to the practice to the business to the enterprise. The practice I call the three-legged stool. (laughs) The practice is actually the franchise prototype. The practice is three legs, lead generation, lead conversion, together client acquisition, and the third leg, client fulfillment. So we're now going to go to work on client acquisition by creating a turnkey lead generation system and a turnkey lead conversion system to provide the optimal number of clients that our client fulfillment system needs to flourish, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. One, just one guy, just one guy, just one practice, just one coach, just one consultant, just one graphic designer, just one, you follow me? Yeah, yeah, I do. Lead generation, lead conversion, client fulfillment, turnkey, 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 absolutely replicable. We've now prepared ourselves to grow a business because a business in this logic tree is nothing other than a subset of up to seven turnkey practices. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Why seven? Seven because this scale of reach, meaning I can't manage more than seven. Okay. So to create Um, A business with eight practices is pushing against my ability to manage it most effectively. Mm -hmm. So we stop at seven. A business is seven practices, turnkey, plus a turnkey management system. See it. See it very, very clearly. Nobody's ever ever defined a business that way, Tim, Mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it, you've completely quantified it. And and this applies, just to, to be clear, to any type of business, does it, Michael? Anything. Tim, we've done it in every business phase on, on earth. Hmm. Every company on the face of the planet. The minute you begin to think like this and plug it into your brain to think like this, it's math. I get it. It can apply to most businesses. I look at my business, which is, I mean, I'm a podcaster and I speak at conferences. And for me, I mean, I'm, I, I have to show up to most things that I do. Tim, that's because you called it a business. It's not a business. It's a job. It's a job. Tim, it's a job. 
Tim speaks. It's a job. Yeah, yeah. it's a good job. When hear this, when it speaks, not Tim, it, it's a business. Uh. So you have to go from Tim speaks to it speaks. Hmm. You got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. The minute you see the possibility of doing that, Tim, you have the ability to grow your company by immense numbers. Is there a massive hurdle along this process, Michael, where yes. you're dealing with, well, there's, <laughs> there's many there's many hurdles, but I imagine a big one is ego, where the business owner goes. Tim, you just, you just called it. I said, yeah, there is a massive obstacle in the way, <laughs> and it's a guy we're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> That's the massive obstacle. So how do you overcome that? I'm, I'm, again, I, it's only a four-hour interview, so I'm conscious of time. But, <laughs> Jim, but, but, you overcome that by being an aggravator. You do, I just piss people off. What can I tell you? Understand, as they begin to see it, as you begin to see this, you can't deny what I'm saying. No. You can't. So, so spend, how quickly can you aggravate me based on what I just told you? Well, Tim, I just shared with you the next phase of growing from a job to a practice to a business to an enterprise. I just shared with you hmm. the hierarchy of growth that Tim Reed can apply to your existing company mm -hmm. by creating a new model of the universe. But Tim Reed's in his own way. All you have to do, Tim, is stop thinking about old co uh, and simply start playing with new co. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Nice. You follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should write a book about this. Yes, I know. You got it, Tim. <laughs> I heard you hear it. Yeah, you did. You did. Beautiful. Uh, uh, wow. Hey, hair's on the back of the shoulder right now, although I don't have any hair on my shoulder. Step eight is, is, is enterprise, right? Let me ask you a question. Go. How many people, when you go speak... Do you typically have in the audience? Uh, anywhere between uh, 100 and 800. Okay. Well, that's a big between, 100 and 800. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah, man. Yeah. They're just they're conferences of small business owners, so it could be no, anything. I got, I, got, yeah. I got it. So I just want you to imagine just for the moment here, not big speaker comes to Wisconsin, hmm. but little big idea comes to Wisconsin in every one of the little cities in Wisconsin. Yep. And now you have turnkey scripting, a turnkey presentation, a video, audio, speaker performance, all turnkey. Mm -hmm. And now you're producing that in every community where there are a sufficient number of small businesses to justify it. Yeah. And the back end of that is what the business really is. Yep. So the idea there, the, the oh, there's a lot of challenges, but the, the main challenge is to find people who can deliver. No, no, no. The main, no, the main challenge <laughs> is to create the system. Hmm. People are easy to find, Tim. Easy, 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 easy. You can do this in a heartbeat. Wow. People are easy to find. Well, people are. Oh, my gosh, you know, they're, yes, they are easy to find. Good people aren't. Great people are easy to find. Love it. Who are great performers, and yet they've never had the chance to do it. You're yeah, giving right. them a turnkey performance that you're going to train them to do, selectively choosing them to go out and be a star. I get it. Come on, you kidding me? How many people want to be a star? Everybody. Many. Yep. Yep. But with Tim's system, it's not only to be a star, it's to have a profound impact yeah. on small business worldwide. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. And that's the enterprise. Is that right? When you get yep, to that point, you've got the enterprise. Yep, thousand. that's the enterprise. Wow. Boy, oh boy, Michael. Uh, it's not often I do an interview where uh, the penny drops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's delightful, Tim. But, you know, the thing is, um, yeah. God, well, the thing is, there's just uh, there's too many questions to, to ask right now. We'll, we'll have to meet again. Can, can, I, can we finish by uh, asking you five quickies, which are completely unrelated to what we've just spoken about? 
Five quickies, and then we got to tell everybody how to get the book. Oh, yeah, don't worry about that. Do not worry okay. about that. Uh, I'm, I'm not even the book. I mean, I want them to know how to get um, beyond the e-myth, but I'm, I'm actually it. interested in also, it's all very well to read a book, but there must be workshops around the world where one enters the dream room and comes out with... A, with let, let, me, let me tell you, on December 9th, 10th, and 11th in La Jolla, California, I'm leading my first three-day dreaming room leading into Beyond the E-Myth, the program. So anybody who's listening to you and really, really is hot to get started, they can come hear me directly for three days, go through the dreaming room to discover their dream, their vision, their purpose, and their mission, and to get started Beyond the E-Myth to transform the state of their lives and the world in what they choose and elect to do. Is that program going to go worldwide? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Next year, 2017? Absolutely. Hmm. Australia? Absolutely. Hmm. Not run by <laughs> Michael, not, not appearing, well, Michael Gerber won't be appearing, no, I'm no, guessing. No, 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 of course not. That's the that myth in action. Joke, correct, correct. Uh, Michael. So what are your five questions? What's the one bad habit you're trying to get rid of? Oh, oh, eating good food. Oh, yeah. What, 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 what's that go-to food that you just know you shouldn't go to? Well, I, I just know I shouldn't do it. <laughs> I just know I shouldn't do it. But, you know, when I've got so much on my mind and my imagination, yeah. when I'm so turned on by good food, yeah, yeah, I just got to say no. I hear you. That's, that's the bad habit. What's at the top of your bucket list? Well, the top of my bucket list is to transform the state of small business worldwide to truly roll this out to millions of people in the world. What about your per- what about your personal bucket list? Do you have a personal bucket list? Um, to leave my wife when I finally leave her mm. with the most magnificent life any woman could lead. I would like to leave my wife with what Ray Kroc left Joan Kroc. Yeah. What a legacy that was, hey? Yep. Uh, what 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 gives you a real belly laugh? <laughs> I don't know. I, you you gave me a belly laugh. <laughs> yeah, there you I go. Get belly, I get a belly laugh all the time, Tim. I <laughs> me mean, too. things are so freaking funny. What can I tell you? <laughs> I'm yeah, with you. You just what's, gotta laugh. What's your favorite holiday destination? I don't have destinations. I don't have holidays that I go to celebrate. Um, I've never liked that. I've never really enjoyed travel. Wow. So I travel all over the world. So unlike most people, I was a guy who went to Indonesia, Bali, Indonesia, mm-hmm. spoke in the afternoon and got in the plane <laughs> that evening to come home. You are a homebody. Nobody does that. <laughs> Good on you. Uh, last one is who's the most famous person? I'm looking forward to this. Who's the most famous person you've ever met? My wife. Oh, Michael, you are a romantic. Is she, in the, is she in the room with you? <laughs> Luz Delia Gerber. Luz Delia Gerber. That's the one. Oh, that's and beautiful. And anybody out there, she's the CEO of our company. She's the most absolutely passionate, magnificent woman I've ever met. Mm. And she is so committed to my legacy. Mm. And that's where I come to saying every life is a legacy. Every small business is school. Mm. And I want you, Tim, and every single person you know who's truly determined to have this profound of an impact on small business, on the people in your country, everywhere in the world, to work with us and join us in our movement. Well, you, 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 the passion that you exude, Michael, uh, I have no doubt you'll achieve it. In order for people to be a part of the movement, am I right in saying they should head over to beyondemyth.com? Yep, beyondemyth.com, E-M-Y-T-H dot com. Or if they want to just reach me and say, I want to play your game, Michael, all they have to do is go to Gerber, G-E-R-B-E-R, at MichaelEGerber.com. Fantastic. That's the that's your uh, that, that'll go to someone within the uh, within the enterprise. Hey, come to me and say Gerber. Somebody emailed you. Love it, love it, uh, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure, and and thank you for doing uh, what you are doing for small businesses around the world. We need it. Oh, thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. 
There you go. Business author extraordinaire, Michael Gerber. Here's three things that grabbed my attention from that chat. Attention grabber number one. Just go and read the e-myth and go and read Beyond the e-myth. They're two kind of books that you must have in your in your small business library. Attention grabber number two. I love the idea of sitting down and asking yourself what your new company would look like based on Michael's e-myth model. Uh, it sounds like a pretty good exercise to do. A little bit of dreaming. To that end, attention grabber number three, don't be afraid to have a dream. I love chatting with business owners who have got a dream, who had a dream, who brought it to life. We've all got to have a dream. We've got to all aim for something, right? Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to the Canberra Airport fellow, Steve Byron, who had a dream and worked backwards and created the Canberra Airport. That was kind of an interesting interview. That's what grabbed my attention. Whatever grabbed yours, be sure to block out some time in your diary and implement it. Come on down. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeed, Lee Doodley. It's time to reward another motivated listener for taking some swift marketing action as a result of listening to this show. And today's winner is... David Noble of Oz Drug Tests. And David says this. Hey, Timbo. Hey, Dave. My name is Dave. I know that. From Oz Drug Tests, and I have to say, I have been listening to your podcast for a very, very long time, and I have implemented so, and he's got like 10 zeros, or O's actually it would be, many marketing ideas. Probably one of the most recent was the episode with Dana DiTomaso, who talked about SEO in detail. Yeah, that was a ripper. That was a two-part episode. Very popular little chat, that one. Dave goes on to say, I paid a developer to make my website run faster and it has really paid off, not just in Google rankings, but in conversions too, because the user experience is so much better. Great action there. I enjoy your podcast so much that I bought your book, The Boomerang Effect. Thank you, Dave. And I attended Dale Beaumont's 52 Ways twice. Hey, Dale Beaumont's past guest of this show. I've also booked tickets for Cham Tang's authentic seminar on digital marketing. Pretty much whatever you say, Timbo, I do. <laughs> Love your work. Careful what you say there, Dave. We've just launched our new brand of alcohol breathalyzer called Bretho. I couldn't believe that name was available, so we trademarked that very quickly. And from your last episode with Lies Alcohol Free Drinks, where you talked about owning the language, like Pass Me the Kleenex, for example, hopefully we can do the same thing with Bretho. Yeah, it's a nice little idea owning a language if you can do that inside your category, Dave. Oh, and we've also started using Sindel as our main transport company. I love it. Dave's just one of those listeners who, you know, I interview someone and he just goes and uses their product. It's pretty good. I like that. I'll tell the sponsors. So please keep doing what you're doing, mate, as I don't think I'd be anywhere near where I am today without your show. Regards, David Noble, ozdrugtesting.com.au. Dave, you're a superstar for implementing, mate. I love your work. As a result, you win a $50 voucher from the beach people, <laughs> the full range of Liars non-alcoholic spirits, valued at over 500 bucks. That's going to put Bretho out of the <laughs> out of a job. That'll close the business. Uh, $50 Sendal voucher, a Basin's Essential Pack from, say, a skincare, that's 79 bucks. A $100 voucher to buy some tradies undies. $50 voucher to buy some Santa Abel PJs. You get a My DNA test kit, that's 99 bucks. Some novelty socks from Put a Sock on It, 18 bucks. An Orbit Key, 49 bucks. Promotion on this show and a backlink. Dave's a winner. Anyone else listening? I think there are other people listening. And if you haven't entered the Monster Prize Draw, all you've got to do is email me, tim at timreed, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Tell me one idea. I know Dave shared a few ideas, but one idea you've implemented from listening to this show and what impact it's had on your business. If I read it out on air, you win. <laughs> That pretty much brings us to the end of episode 467. Uh, Reminder that you'll find plenty more where this came from on the podcast One Australia app, plus my entire archive of episodes and blog posts full of ideas to grow your business is over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. 
Next episode, you and I are going to catch up with a couple of digital nomads who are running a million dollar hat business from the back of their combi. If you're getting value from listening, please let other business owners know about it. This podcast was presented by me, Timbo Reed, and cleverly pulled together by the highly diligent team at Podcast One Australia. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. Now get out there and take action.